Welcome to Healthcare Rounds. I'm your host, John Marchica, CEO of Darwin Research Group and faculty associate at the Arizona State University College of Health Solutions. Here we explore the vast and rapidly evolving healthcare ecosystem with leaders across the spectrum of healthcare delivery. Our goal is to promote ideas that advance the quadruple aim, including improving the patient experience, improving the health of populations, lowering the cost of care, and attaining joy in work. Please send your questions, comments, or ideas for Healthcare Rounds to podcast at darwinresearch.com. And if you like what you hear, please don't forget to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get started. Today, we welcome Dr. Daniel Durand. Dr. Durand serves as a Chief Innovation Officer and Chairman of Radiology for LifeBridge Health. Dr. Durand led the LifeBridge Health ACO LLC and previously served as the first Director of Accountable Care for Johns Hopkins Medicine. Prior to Hopkins, Dr. Durand was a Vice President and member of the Executive Leadership Team at Evelyn Health, a healthcare IT startup. He also worked as an associate with McKinsey & Company out of the firm's Washington, D.C. office. Dr. Durand earned his medical degree at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and has over 20 years of experience in healthcare, science, and technology. So Dr. Durand, to kick things off, you have a really interesting background uh, and a diverse background. So I thought maybe you could just start off by orienting our audience with the path that's taken you to now be the Chief Innovation Officer for LifeBridge. Sure. Um really depends on where you want to start that, but I'll just start it with my professional life. Um, I was a, a junior faculty member at, at Johns Hopkins. To, to get to that point, you have to, you know, do undergraduate med school and sort of keep your head down and, and uh, just do the prescriptive path in a way for quite a long period of time. And there were a lot of entrepreneurial pursuits that I had done to the side uh, during medical school in addition to, um, residency and uh, also a lot of scientific research that I've been involved in. But I came out the the, the end of that and, and the, the beginning of my professional life faculty at Hopkins, really feeling like I wanted to move a little bit more nimbly than you can in an organization that size. And I wanted to understand um, why US healthcare seemed to be somehow less than the sum of its parts. I mean, we have mm. great research, we have great schools, I, you know, I think we have great individuals and people that are very mission driven who choose medicine as a calling, but I felt like the system felt very dysfunctional and I wanted to understand that better. And all of this was right around the time of uh, the Affordable Care Act, a little bit after that. So mm -hmm. I left academia, I think the biggest decision I made that sort of puts me where I am today versus other, you know, less diverse or, or more standard jobs is I left a very typical academic track to go work for McKinsey. And at the time it was, I'll work here for a year and see what the rest of the world functions like, see, see why um, these changes are so difficult um, to, to make happen in the real world, even though seemingly so many people agree on some of them. Things like value-based care, which at the time, from my perspective, there are very few people that didn't agree uh, that fee-for-service was inherently broken and that something different needed to be done. So I went to McKinsey and I sort of majored in that while I was there. Uh, I worked with Medicare uh, on some of their reorganization. I worked with a variety of private companies that I, where I can't really uh, at liberty to, to share based on um, consulting arrangements. But there were hospital systems looking to either improve their throughput uh, on an inpatient basis uh, or there were health systems looking to figure out how to pivot from volume to value. Those are the areas I worked in. And one thing led to another, and I, I joined a company as uh, the founding members of one of their clinical consulting groups called Evelyn Health. And Evelyn was a company founded in, I think, 2011. I'm not one of the founders. I was part of the sort of second wave of professionals that went there. Mm -hmm. I was probably the second or third doctor uh, that was a full-time employee. And uh, it was a bunch of ex-McKinsey, ex-UPMC, ex-advisory board people who really believed um, that the path to better healthcare was a journey towards value-based care, but that it was going to be very, very difficult for um, the, the large health systems that still provide the majority of care, at least hospital care, to people in this country. It was going to be very difficult for them to get there and for their senior teams to understand the sequence of steps. And it would be different for every market. Um, and that there's a lot of opportunity, but a tremendous amount of complexity. So Evelyn was built 
as sort of part consulting services um, to help people with what we call a population health, health blueprint, or later on it was called a value-based care blueprint, and migrate them uh, to get more and more of their business at risk over time, and then help them with the software, the people, the processes, the technology, all that stuff that it takes to start to assume that kind of risk on providing value versus just smoothly doing many transactions in a volume-oriented system. Sure. Uh, so that was about two plus years of my life with Evelyn. Um, traveled all over the country, uh, was in the C-suite with lots of different health systems. So it was a really interesting time where I got exposed to a huge diversity of perspectives and markets. And one of the things I became aware of uh, from a value-based care perspective was that there was a lot of tension out there. The tension not necessarily between people or, or um, entities, but tension between philosophies. And as you could have a conversation with a CEO and a CFO, both of whom firmly believe that better healthcare for everybody, including their family members, lay on the other side of this chasm between fee-for-service and, and, and value. And furthermore, they could get a board motivated about it, or the board might bring it to them, and they might even mm. make significant progress. But it, there's a point at which you start to financially harm yourself in some of these arrangements, and you have to really, really believe that on the other side of that chasm is something that works for the health system and the five, 10, 15,000 employees that depend on those leaders, you know, for their jobs. Right. Um, and, and what I noticed was that there was a lack of a true alignment in many geographies. And a, lo um, a lot of these groups would eventually start retreating, even if they believed in what was on the other side of the chasm, eventually the chasm seemed too risky, right? The, the cure started seeming worse than the disease, you know, to put it a different way. Right. Um, around that time, uh, Evelyn went public which you know, I think was an achievement, but it's also usually a, a time when the operations and philosophy of the business start to change. And um, Maryland as a, as a state right around that time went to capitation for the hospitals. And I was still living in Maryland as where my, my family um, you know, uh, and my children are based. And I thought that was a really unique time to come back to the state, having been out there and seen a lot of what does and doesn't work with very many clients, but, and, and two different large organizations with McKinsey and Evelyn, and the cool thing about Evelyn was being there um, at that time, and maybe it's still like this, that you, you get people that were from all the different com major companies. So people from Anthem or Optum, people from UPMC. We, we did a lot of our pitches to our initial clients in the UPMC steel tower because they were a major uh, investor. So it was kind of this um, mecca of people interested in both the care uh, delivery transformation as well as value-based care people from the payer side, the provider side, the pure IT side, the design thinking side, like it was a really cool place to be for two years. And um, at, when Marilyn decided to become capitated, sorry, I'm flipping a text message there. Uh, when Marilyn decided uh, as a state to become tap capitated, I, I, I don't have a three hour lecture I can give here on the economics in Maryland, but you know, folks at home, Maryland is, is does Medicare differently than every other state. And it's a longstanding thing that, that basically stems from the fact that in 1978, the, most of the rest of the country and eventually all of the country went to DRGs for inpatient Medicare hospitalizations. And Ma Maryland managed to exempt themselves from that, probably initially mainly due to hospital lobbying, but it's become a quite a bit more than that. And so Maryland does this interesting experimentation in order to stay below the cost growth of the rest of the country. And every few years, we're doing something different. Um, in 2014, that something different was we are going to be effectively capitate hospital payments. And it is a really complex thing that is uh, different than what capitation looks like elsewhere. But effectively, once you do that, if, if you buy into it as a health system, your hospital costs just become costs, you know, and, and your revenues right. are, are the number of attributed patients, which is sort of an equivalent. So you become, you start to think a lot more like a payer. Right. And so that lack of alignment I had seen nationally, um, I had good reason to believe that we would have less of that issue in Maryland and be able to make more of these long term strategic investments uh, that you need to make. And that to give the, the health system leadership teams here the stomach to get through those difficult parts that were reversing the work in a lot of the other geographies. Um, and if you just read the news, I feel like you don't know that the work has been reversed in some of the other geographies, because if you go back to 2011, 12, you know, if you go back in the news archives and the internet, the Wayback Machine, you'll find all these announcements, you know, from payers and providers saying, hey, 
they're kind of declaring victory before they even start. We're going to do a value-based arrangement. We're going to save the taxpayers $500 million. They never put out a press release when it fails, right? Or when they, de- right. when they, when they lay off all the teams that are working on that. Um, so it's interesting to go back and look for those kind of tre- press releases in places like North Carolina, South Carolina, and really see what became of them. Because the industry doesn't always hold a mirror up to itself and, and acknowledge what's actually going on. But the cool thing is coming back to Maryland, um, I do feel like I've, I, uh, that, that is really not a me thing, but I, I, I've been the beneficiary of, I think, so a very um, consistent set of strategies in this geography that are above the level of health systems. And it's made it really easy to be well aligned with, um, well aligned for clinical and finance and, and, and the boards and everybody else, the hospitals, the ambulatory networks. The alignment is not perfect because it's the real world, but the alignment is vastly better than I experienced in other geographies. You know, outside of systems like Kaiser uh, or UPMC, where there's been all this work done over many years, and they have a huge payer arm and a huge provider arm, but even in those instances, there's there can be tremendous tension within the same organization between the payer and the provider side. So in Maryland, the, a lot of that um, weight is taken off the shoulders of the local owners, right? And and it rests on the regulatory um, edifice of what we call the um, HSCRC, which is a cost review commission. And it's not a perfect system, but again, it has allowed um, me to function initially at Hopkins and, and, more, and for the last five years at LifeBridge in a way that um, if I pick my innovations correctly and, and tilt them towards value-based care, I am not fighting against or viewed as harming the traditional parts of the healthcare system because the reimbursement is already structured such that they need those innovations, right? Um, and I guess so the last, so I came, I went to, uh, Hopkins from Evelyn and ran their ACO for a year and then came for a broader scope um, to a smaller system at LifeBridge and uh, helped build their clinically integrated network. Um, And about two years ago, really decided to uh, pivot and and for a time, and I'm still in this kind of phase, be very, very focused on the, a little more on the tactics than the strategy in a way, not that the job isn't strategic, but really getting down to when you try to transform care delivery how much of that needs to take place in the four walls of the hospital or even in the four walls of the, of the office, right? The bricks and mortar versus the call center versus telehealth versus remote monitoring versus chatbots. Really thinking and assessing all these different parts of technology that health systems uh, will bolt onto themselves to become more than what they are uh, and to scale what they are. So that the, you know, kind of at the beginning, one of my frustrations with our industries versus others as of 10 years ago was that I really felt that paradoxically, we were less than some of our parts, right? Mm. And the reason we're less than some of our parts is we, as, as a nation, I feel like is because payers are very fragmented. When they innovate, half the time their innovations are just sort of blocking an innovation by providers. So providers take 15 years, uh, well, it, researchers take 15 years using government money, they find a new cure, providers start using it, but then they use it too much, then the payers have to come up with an innovation to you know, basically make less of that other innovation go on. And uh, if you economically align folks, I believe that you'll see less of that um, arms race and you will see more synergy and people working together. So around these technologies, we've built an innovation center with Care First. It's been a two year project. Um, We are launching right now for our first incubation cohort. We have 115 applications for four spots, which is we're gonna get four great spots. And uh, four great companies, maybe five. We're going to bring them in. They're going to get pilots with both entities. They're going to get strategic investment from both entities. And so that as as, as LifeBridge is innovating in, in this sort of digital care space, um, rather than innovate and then have the payer figure out how to anti-innovate and spend money, we're going to spend money together, figure out what we agree on, given all the aligned economics and the aligned goals. And then we're not, and we're not going to waste money. We're going to innovate together so that the system is more than the sum of its parts, not less. Makes sense. You know, I want to get to um, some of those projects and and talk a little bit about uh, about LifeBridge. But I, I wonder, just kind of going back to where you were in, back in 11, 12, and 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 after that, and talking about how there was this tension between, you know. And people use the analogy all the time, like one foot in the boat and one foot on the shore, and you know that they yeah. really wanted to. They see the benefit in value-based care, but then other forces are driving them backwards. So where do you think, as you kind of look outside the state of Maryland, where do you, 
how would you assess where we are today? With respect to, I mean, it's so it's so regionally it's so regionally complex. I I feel that nationally, kind of taking myself out of the taking my life bridge and my Maryland hats off. Here's here's Dan Dan's opinion, which is one guy's opinion nationally. Um, and I and I also preface this with, I'm too operationally focused, you know, and medically focused, honestly, to really be a policy expert. You, you can't, you know, I don't pretend to be an expert at everything. So I'm, I'm going to tick hardcore policy people off as I oversimplify here. Um, from from 2008 when Obama came in through let's say 2012 or 13, this, there was this wave of um, mixed enthusiasm for value-based care. I think prior to 2008, there actually was a lot of alignment in both circles. You could argue that with the individual mandate in Massachusetts and a lot of the um, publications in, in places like HBR, that the right was, was pushing value-based care at that point just as much as the left. Once ACA came out, I do think it became a little more um, politicized. And as it started to be implemented, you could feel that, right? So implementation started in 2011 or so, um, or maybe even earlier with the Pioneer. I honestly uh, forget, you know, all these dates. And you saw a lot of, um, in parallel to that, a lot of commercial plans doing ACOs. And, and right. you know, you had one big ACO program that was maybe three or 400 uh, health systems and, and, and various entities, let's say 2014 or so. And you had just as many totally fragmented programs and different in every geography with all the payers. What started to emerge was a construct of um, quality gated shared savings that was almost always uh, upside only, so really not true risk for the providers. Right. And the idea was it would it would mature like these capabilities around maximizing the quality would gradually teach people how to do certain things, uh, both within the office, but also strategically within their health system, uh, and they would migrate and and you had all these analogies, right? And one is a foot and two canoes or whatever. At the same time, the country was changing, right? So there was actually great economic prosperity, uh, at least higher employment. I mean, you could, again, argue about whether the wage growth was or, you know, where it needed to be or not, but the economic indices, whether it's the stock market or the consumer confidence index, those all really got quite a bit better, you know, from 2014 to 2018 relative to 2008 to 2014 and beforehand. And what I perceived was employ and, and because the employment market was so robust and things were good, all of the anticipated competition. So people had anticipated part of the thesis for value-based care was that economics will continue to deteriorate, that the population will continue to age and that the entitlement crisis will loom. And between Medicare and private, insur uh, private insurers needing to decrease the growth in the cost of care, it would uh, necessitate the emergence of value-oriented networks, more narrow networks, things we saw in parts of the country that were economically a little bit um, more, I don't say destitute, but having a harder time, you know, in, in the uh, post-industrial Midwest, that you would see more, more aggressive narrow networks and that providers were gonna have to deal with this. But in fact, you know, in the middle part of the last decade, consumers uh, or employers started to kind of compete on the broadness of their plans as a benefit again. And there wasn't this huge emergence of narrow networks that everybody thought was going to happen. I mean, it may have happened in certain places, but it, in general, it was like very lackluster. And uh, gradually, the enthusiasm for value-based care became tempered. I've never heard people say that it's not the future, but I think it became much more tempered. And there was a lot of pivoting back and forth at the federal level. One of the things I think that has really hurt value-based care is um, the macro legislation which again is middle of last decade and there are lots of pieces to it. Um, they really backed down on this and, and, and the professional societies within medicine encouraged, I think, the, um, the government to back down. So what was macro? It was basically the idea that you got to show your quality, not just the amount of turns through the uh, turnstile, but you really got to show your quality as a doctor providing ambulatory care on, on the Part B side. So for a while, Medicare has had like readmissions penalties and other stuff going on, on the inpatient side. And macro is the idea that your rates for Medicare will be partially determined by how well you can demonstrate within your specialty or, or within your specialty group that you're delivering on quality. And they spent tons of money and everybody spent tons of time. I mean, uncounted hours of my life, right, with my health system and others trying to figure out not just how to, you know, convince Medicare that quality is good, but how to really change your culture around these things. 
But the problem is that in order to fund MACRA, in order to give more money to people who did well, the way the program works, right, and this makes sense, is you take money away from people that didn't do well. Of course. And no one ever had the stomach to do that. I'll just, I'll just skip to the end for everybody, all right? <laughs> Nobody ever had the stomach to do that. So it's just this thing that is now almost like, I think it hurts value-based care because people say, oh, you're talking about value again. Is this going to be like macro where I spend, like I get 50 consultants to come in here and tell me how much more money I'm going to make, you know, for my health system to, to, to really pay back these huge investments you're asking me to make around analytics and everything else. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to make any of that because you're not going to take it away from the people that didn't make those investments, right? Or who couldn't perform. Um, and it kind of gets, and, and, and I think the AMA is frankly kind of complicit in it. And it kind of comes back to this thing. If you go to a, an auditorium of doctors, right? All these guys that, and, and, and girls that spend all their lives going through medicine and they're generally a high achieving, somewhat competitive uh, group. And you say, hey guys, who here is an average, you know, who here is in, uh, in the bottom 30% of doctors with, within their quality? You know, nobody raises their hand, right? Percent. Which like pride is a good thing, but you, know, you can't ask people to sort of hold themselves accountable for these kinds of things. And um, yeah, I think macro was just a really big failed experiment. And I'm not sure that I haven't really heard about it called such uh, like on the pages of any journals just yet, but uh, I'll just say privately, a lot of people like myself that have been working in the quality and value-based arrangements sphere don't really feel like that was very helpful because now that, now that we've had this big sort of national joke over this, um, it, it, it makes it harder to push people that, uh, you know, on, on, uh, on investments and say, you'll, you'll invest in quality, but you'll get your money back. Um, well, not if the government ultimately doesn't have the stomach to, you know, deliver and, on, and implement its own uh, programs. So is the answer, is the answer to this, you know, conundrum, I was going to ask you if, if quality uh, or value-based care is dead. And of course it's, it's not in it, you know, in a sense, but is the answer getting there through technology, um, getting there through um, the kinds of things that you're working on now, or um, because the philosophically, the financial system or politically that the solutions that we try to come up with and implement we just can't move the needle. But perhaps, you know, I had a lot of questions for you and I, I'm going to ask if you have a hard stop in five minutes, but I have a lot of questions around technology. I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, is AI going to get us there? Is some of the projects that you're working on? I'm going to sort of consultify your question and say, is it, is it people, process or, or technology, you know, that, that matters? Let's just start with that bucket sure. of thing. It could certainly be other stuff, right? But um, going back, you know, to the, the theories that I'm familiar with, and, and um, I'm, I'm not a, an economist, so I'm sort of uh, taking other people's stuff that I've read and, and, and extrapolating here. You know, if you go back 10 years or so, one of the big theories as to why education and healthcare keep, keep on getting more expensive, and I think this theory still holds, um, is that other, uh, other sectors of the, of the economy have done a better job at substituting labor for capital, or capital, sorry, substituting capital for labor, we'll put it that way. So in other words, you know, one worker with the right technology is associated with them that, that needs a capital investment and some OPEX tail, but you invest in something and then you put it next to a worker and they become a lot more productive and if you do this over the, over the full um, you know, portion of an industry, then that industry starts to look a lot more productive relative to other industries. And this goes on and on and on for things like, let's say, travel agencies you know, or um, you know, newspaper publishing, right? I mean, it's, it's painful because people get laid off, right? But gradually, these industries become more and more scalable and more productive. But industries that require an in-person touch, like education you know, or beauty salons, right? or healthcare, just don't enjoy that. So over time, if you look at consumer price indices and things, it, healthcare takes up a larger share of the wallet than it used to, as does education. And, um, and it's thought that that fundamental lack of scalability lies at the core. So if you believe that, and I gotta say, I, I believe that. Do I, do I know enough about economics to know if that explains everything? Like, no. And so there are a lot of people that can poke holes in that. But I think that that is mostly true. I, that's been a core belief of mine since I learned economics as an undergraduate at Wake Forest 20 years ago. Um, yeah, so part of my interest in technology is that uh, a fundamental be bedrock part of our problem in healthcare is that lack of scalability. And 
it, it, having seen it up close for about two decades, it's not just about the tech not being there, but there are layers of things that are barriers to that scalability. One, at, the, at the most basic level, regulatory and, 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 and liability are probably the single biggest part of that. And it's not necessarily getting any simpler because um, then HIPAA you know, is made in the mid nineties and that starts to interact with um, other types of liability and, and cyber attack type um, risks that emerge. And so it's in some ways it's probably getting worse on the regulatory and liability side rather than better. Um, and it might be necessary evil, but it, it's, it can, it's a big disconnect between us and other industries that have less of that going on and where the stakes are a little bit, frankly, lower. Um, but a big part of it is cultural. And that's the part I'm trying to work on right now, which is because those that first layer of legal liability has built a moat around health systems for so long, there is the expectation that we won't even engage in, in, in a lot of the productivity work that other industries have been frankly obsessed with. And that needs to change. And I think the biggest thing that's starting to move the needle on that isn't people like me that want to move the needle because I think there's been a lot of people like me over time. I don't think I'm the first person to have these ideas. But I do think that there's such an emerging chasm between the consumer experience and the rest of their lives, right? Versus the consumer experience in healthcare. And yeah. the government has actually, the government's been really good at making, uh, at holding, at holding, um, maybe too good at holding providers really accountable for the experience, right? Um, so, with age caps and all that, and, and people kind of shop with being more free agents in healthcare and being able to, to choose one provider versus another, and the ratings being online, I think that's really healthy stuff, and it is creating a real need. I think that more than anything is what's creating the need for consumers. Uh, sorry, for health systems to master these productivity and, and IT things because the consumer, um, they no longer want to, like I'll give you an example. I'll give you an, an, uh, an EG on this, right? So access is a big deal. Um, access is a big deal. It's one of these Venn diagram overlap areas between fee for service and value. No matter what you're doing, whether you think your geography is just concierge medicine or whether you think your geography is pure Medicaid risk or, or full, full risk agreements, you need to figure access out, right? Along with a few other things. And so access becomes a big deal. So how do we experience access? How do we measure it? How do we offer it? Well, what, we used to build call centers or just extra bricks and mortar, right? Like you want people to be able to right. find care, hire more doctors, create more wait, bigger waiting rooms, have more call centers. If, if a patient in 2021, um, you know, wants to become a patient in your health system, and they are forced to go through those traditional things. They are going to choose another health system. And they're not even going to do it by having to drive there post COVID. They're literally just going to have to download an app on their phone or go to, if you're in New York City, go to the NYP on demand site, right? Or if they already have insurance through an innovative um, insurance company, they're going to go to that app that they downloaded four months ago and get their, their symptoms triaged. And this is, this is more and more the case. So because consumers are really forcing the issue, it's a pretty beautiful, I would say, pretty American thing. You know, I still, still believe in using that, that word that way. And people's expectations are what is really um, forcing health systems and people like me within health systems to really say this culture that we've had doesn't work. Like where every department wants to have its own unique little pathway to getting an appointment there right? That works for that department. You can say, hey, that works for that department. It's always worked for that department. It works for those individuals who work there, who want our workforce to be happy. Okay. But the consumer wants it all to look pretty much the same way and they want it easy and they want it to feel like more like Uber than, um, you know, going to a doctor's office um, 20 years ago. And that's just reality, right? And so convincing folks that there is this burning platform is a lot less difficult when, when you see it happening in real time when patients are complaining about their experience, when you start to hear feedback from consumer surveys that people are choosing other providers because you're not providing X, Y, or Z, um, you know, now that becomes a big deal. So our access strategy is, I think, been one of the most transformative things we've worked on in the past two years. And we're trying to use the fact that we're smaller, right, than a Hopkins or a MedStar or Maryland. We're and we're in relatively good financial shape. I mean, I think everybody is, who knows about the future, but we're, I think we're, we're, we've made good decisions and been, and been, um, haven't overspent on silly things. 
But I think we're looking at, I mean, we are looking at access and we're doubling or tripling down there, particularly after this last year, because we could take ourselves as a small health system and become massively accessible with the right strategy. And a big part of that strategy is what scales, what kind of particularism and exceptionalism at the local departmental level or the office level are you willing to let go? And how do you balance that sort of um, a little more corporate culture from other industries with the natural culture of medicine and physicians? That's really tricky. You know, and that's why in any other industry, you have someone that's much more, you know, has just a pedigree doing this kind of thing that's more like an um, electrical engineer, software type, you know, in our industry, you have folks like me doing it because you really have to understand and translate all this to what the doctors are doing every day, what the nurses are doing every day, you know, and why they, you know, how to get them to yes on some of these things. Um, for example, these common pathways, right? Like you want it to be easy for the patient to, or consumer to access your health system. You don't want to get to the level where you're letting an analyst that is really good at building schedules and um, AI algorithms and ingesting insurance information to make a, a seamless experience to the consumer. You know, if they if they just run everything, then every appointment block is going to look the same. Like they don't know enough about medicine to know. Well, the orthopedic surgeon needs like these 15 different appointment types, and this right. particular orth orthopedic surgeon really only wants to see three of those. And it's not just about them being difficult. That's just what they're really good at treating, and that's where the quality is. You know, so. It gets very, you have to really micro dissect this as you get closer to the point of care. Um, and that's where the medical background uh, comes in. Interesting. So it's almost like, I mean, I'm oversimplifying this, but the degree to which um, technology has affected our lives has, has um, put an expectation or consumers now have an expectation of a certain kind of experience, no matter no matter what they're buying, no matter what goods and services that they're, they're buying, right? Because 25, 30 years ago, you had a rotary dial phone or maybe you had a touchstone phone and you'd call up and you'd make an appointment and it was all part of the expectations were much lower. Now, when you've got, you know, your iPhone, you're accustomed to using apps, you're accustomed to almost instantaneous service. But to your point, it's not as easy as just, you know, setting up my chart or, you know, my, you know, to be able to get this to work right, you have to get the clinicians involved to ensure that that orthopedic surgeon that only wants to see these th three types of people or three types of procedures because that's what he or she is good at that requires an entirely different um level of commitment really i mean yeah. how do you get that right that's that's tough and if you get it wrong you know uh, you can really alienate you know alienating a few customers um as much as like Patients certainly come first, but if you alienate a surgeon by, by over-indexing on what you think patients want, you know, and you lose the surgeon, that doesn't help patients writ large, right? That hurts your health system and it hurts access. So you have to be, our general approach to these things is to, is, is to work on them. Um, we want to be nimble and want to be fast, right? But we definitely want something to be like fully baked. Like we don't put stuff out there in beta. Right. We, we just don't do that. We really try to make it pretty fully baked because we don't want patients to have bad experiences and we don't want to lose doctors over. They came to clinic one day and it was all the wrong kinds of visits, you know, or, the, or there wasn't like good um, uh, gathering of information relative to what they're they might have had more of a manual process in the past that is highly inefficient, that is infuriating for patients. Right. Like all these extra forms you got to fill out by hand and stuff. So as we take them to paperless and try to make their offices flow better. Um, you know, if you, if the first day of that is really miserable and, you know, um, and the second day is much better at some point, you know, you can lose, you can lose control of this. And so we have developed a core group of people that gets these things done. Um, and the pace is pretty conservative, uh, relative to what you might see in other industries. Like in, in another industry, you know, maybe Chick-fil-A is going to try like a, a new, a new this or that with one of their lines, right? Like they're highly organized, but they can do kind of a B testing. Nobody's you know, it's food people are putting in their body, but if you're just talking about process changes, you can try it out. And the worst thing that might happen is people, the workers at one Chick-fil-A might have, might be annoyed that day. Maybe you have slightly of turnover that month at one of your offices, right? But like your, your overall brand is intact because you're huge, right? With healthcare, you know, it's just, it's just, you might, if you tweak stuff like that, a diagnosis could be missed. You could lose a surgeon who, who might be half of your assets in that area because health systems are smaller and you know, there's lots of um, more pluralistic parts than an assembly line, let's say, like in a 
in another industry. And I'm using Chick-fil-A because I think they're about one of the best businesses out there. Okay. I mean, I pull politics aside, like they know their stuff, right? When the right. Um, mass, there's a mass vaccination clinic that was um, having a really difficult time down in, in South Carolina and they traffic backed up for three hours and they called up Chick-fil-A to fix it, which I thought was a, you know, a smart move. So I, I, I you know, I, we, we draw on these kind of parallels. And so, but if you look at other industries and their kind of threshold for experimentation of operations and, and ways that they can do A-B testing, I mean, Google can do it massively quick. Anytime someone searches, they can just tweak it and see how that works. They're not going to get sued over a bad search, right? Um, but healthcare is harder. You have to be much closer to your final product when you deploy it. And, you know, you, you can't just sort of naturally evolve with A-B testing for most things. You can do it in some areas. There's no question you can do it in some areas, particularly toward the front of the funnel when it comes to like marketing and search and a little bit when it comes to triage and things like that as well. But at some point you, you wind up as you get closer to the encounter in, in, in this space that has to be much more mistake free uh, than most industries. And so it's a challenge. Uh, scalability is a challenge. Um, and because uh, the content is different between specialties and um, nimbleness is, is, a, is a fundamental trade-off between how nimble you can be in your, in your operational experimentation and then the sort of just the reality of healthcare and the regulations and liability. So I had a question around HIPAA. We talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, I was thinking about, okay, what's my recent experience with healthcare? So um, I had uh, bone spurs on my toes removed. That was fun. Um, I had um, the uh, PRP on my elbow and my knees and my wrist. Um, I had uh, primary care, two primary care visits. Um, uh, there's one that I'm that I'm forgetting about, and of course all of those interactions with the pharmacy. None of these, none of these events, did, did anybody in the continuum understand or know about my healthcare from any of the other areas? So every time I'm filling out forms, every time I'm entering in new information, every time I'm getting my insurance information. Um, where are we in this journey? to getting to true interoperability and is HIPAA one of the barriers to getting to that place or is it more of a technology problem? Yeah. So at some point you should have, if you haven't already, a HIPAA expert on your show so they can untangle whatever I'm about to, you know, say with my, again, like I'm not a lawyer, but yeah, HIPAA is a big part of it. Um, HIPAA was really written in, I think, 1996. Um, it's tough for uh, IT laws to remain relevant within decades. So when you put it 25 years out, um, it's no surprise that this huge law is very bulky and uh, um, not, I think, serving people uh, in, in great ways at this point. Um, there are ways that it still protects people in important ways, but, it, but by and large, no one's ever done a study that I'm aware of, right? That shows how many people might have died because of HIPAA. And, and, and you know, People react when I say that, but I don't, I don't know why they should. I mean, it's, it's an action we took as a society or the people took on our behalf in, at the federal level. Right. It, it definitely makes certain types of information sharing harder. And it'd be hard for me to believe people, that there has been significant human consequence to the ways that it doesn't work. And someone ought to look at it. Um, not so much as startups can get rich, but so that we can improve and make the, the system more intelligent. One of the ways that people that because HIPAA is so um, dysfunctional in many ways, and because our government, frankly, is so dysfunctional, uh, there's a guy named Anish Chopra, who I believe is a Democrat, but he's fairly centrist, and he's he's the CEO of, of a company called uh, Care Journey, I believe. But he's been working for many years, along with others, to sort of build a movement around consumers that want to experience what you're referencing. You can waive, you know, your HIPAA. Um, if you want to waive the protections, and I don't know if you can waive them partially or, you know, you know either like, um, like veto power in each block or, or if you have to do all of them together. Um, but if you want to waive that, a lot more becomes possible with your data. And if there was some sort of codified central repository for people doing that, um, you, you can imagine sort of like a, at least a, a, an environment would exist where people could sort of say, I don't care as much about my privacy, you know, like make it all work for me, right? Um, and we've had people come to us who have more, not, not so much in what I'm gathering based on the procedures and, and services you've listed, uh, you sound like what I would describe as a 
fairly healthy guy, you know, with a few specific things that you needed to get addressed, um, but not someone who, you know, has a massive amount of comorbid conditions going on. But as you get older, you know, eventually that happens to everybody. And when we speak to Medicare beneficiaries uh, directly, who who are in that kind of um, period of their life where they have more complexity, many of them will verbalize a sentiment as follows. Not all of them, but many will say, listen, I care much more about my financial information security. I don't want anyone like getting my social security number or make, you know, I got to figure out how to put, put food on the table in my fixed income life. And that in that area, I'm super tight about my credit card numbers and all that type of thing. Um, but I don't have any conditions I'm embarrassed about. And frankly, I don't really care who has my medical information as long as they know how to help me. Right. right. That is the attitude of many seniors in this country. Many of them. Not all of them. There, there are people with mental health conditions. You know, there are people with, with HIV that might, you know, and other things that are stigmatized and it is their right to, to decide whether or not they want to share it. But there are a significant number of people out there who truly believe that keeping the information bottled up is much more dangerous to them than anything that might happen as a result of others knowing the information. I would agree. With um, that. And I would say a growing number of people, right? And so HIPAA, um, the more those people are educated as to what what HIPAA makes not possible for them, you may see more of them decide to opt out of it. Uh, so yeah, that, I, I, th- I think that, that HIPAA needs to change and it'd be great if we could just sort of pick what works about HIPAA and, and, and clear out what doesn't, but it's a very legislatively complex task in a country where you know, the, the most basic stuff seems to be a challenge at the federal level in terms of passing laws. So. Yeah, so last question before we wrap up, but I, I think it's an important one. Um, you know, we talked about data. What's, what do you see in terms of, you know, patient data assets? What's the low hanging fruit? Like for your health system or for many health systems, something that isn't getting done or something that um, where you feel that you could bridge the gap between your system and payers and maybe even pharma companies and clinical trials. Like, is there a, is there a, a common low hanging fruit that you think that, that, people should be focused on and, and is attainable today? So one of my core beliefs, which is going to explain my answer to this question, is I, I am just of the, of the um, opinion that it's been many years in this country where we've been in a, and most of the industrialized world, where we're in a position where if we really want to extend life expectancy, it's less about what we need to discover. I mean, you can always discover a new cure for disease, but it's more about how in my opinion and many others, figuring out how to more consistently deliver what we already know works to people the right way. You know, and if we did that, we would see a bigger life expectancy than if we get a new cure for a given disease, because even if we get that new cure for that new disease, if we don't know how to deliver it, we're only gonna get part of the life expectancy bump anyway. Um, so how does that, so I'm gonna focus more on the payer provider part of this because that's really delivery. Um, the life sciences, clinical trials part of it, yeah, there's stuff that can be done there, but I don't think that, I think that's at this point, the 20 and not the 80. Now, um, you could say with COVID, there, there's, you know, it's, it's shown how we still need discovery. And I'm not saying we don't, but I, I still believe that most of what we need to do to improve outcomes is, is in that payer provider continuum, okay? And whether it's government payer or, or private payer or self-pay, I'm just gonna kind of consider that all the same for the, for the purposes of this. Um, Three trillion plus dollars gets spent on healthcare. I think we're going to start to talk about four trillion too. I think we're right at that um, thing. We're going to start rounding up, right? Whether it's three trillion or four trillion, uh, about a third of it is administrative, and part of those administrative salaries are, you know, I, I think like people like me, you know, and um, pe- people that are leaders at health systems or leaders at the department level. Like there's administrative work that uh, is not frontline patient-facing work that needs to be done. But there's also a lot of this arms race mentality between payers and providers. And so a significant amount of that one to 1.5 trillion that's administration is just people spending money twice to have a non-solution to a problem. And one of the ways that I think- Can you tease that out a little? Just people spending money twice. So if you look at the history of, of, um, of inpatient concurrent review, is a good example, all right? So inpatient concurrent review is when you get admitted to a hospital, like the second you get admitted, behind the scenes, the health, the hospital and the health system 
are trying to, to prove and code for the fact that you're there and you have a condition, you need our help and that your, your, your insurance company needs to acknowledge that and, and, and start queuing up for payment. And at the other side of this, the insurance company is acknowledging that you're there, letting us know what your benefits are. But then in many cases, as, as the days go on, um, sort of saying, hey, like you guys need to manage this patient better, right? Or, or prove to us that they need to be there. Um, and on the outpatient side, it's like, before you ever show up for an MRI, there's this adjudication over medical necessity. Now, some of that is driven by algorithms and fairly automated, which is a good thing because you don't want unnecessary care delivered. And algorithms are a great way for, to take the evidentiary basis that exists and sort of in real time, make sure that, um, that this service is indicated. But there's also a lot of people, right, that are involved in working these jobs and, and administrating the algorithms. And over time, the number of people has gone up on both sides because as much as the provider might not want to spend money on it, on the payer side, if they have a target they need to hit one year, they may say, hey, you know, we need to save another $5 million. Let's look a little closer to imaging and put another two or three people in to review it because every person we put in to review it tends to eliminate five or six studies. And so you have the appearance that you're like lowering the cost of care, but over the time, you're just adding two bodies to both sides. So whether it's concurrent review or utilization management, right? And it also, you also see it in areas where people are trying to help. So you might have a care manager that's gonna help someone navigate the health system within the health doctor's office, but then you got another one on the payer side and then that just starts to confuse the patient. So again, the, the, the sum ends up lower than this, the, the whole ends up lower than the sum of the parts. So in, in all of these areas, the more that you share data, both on what you're doing and how you do it, um, you can you could agree on like, for, like let's let's put a, uh, for, for example, let's take utilization management. I'm going to take one little piece of this. You could perhaps imagine a future. This is not happening anywhere today that I'm aware of. But let's say in the future, the medical director of an insurance company and the medical director of, let's say, uh, an outpatient imaging chain, they get together and they actually get really on the same page in theory on what's indicated and what's not for, for a scope of services, like let's say MRI for, for the joints, all right? And then they mutually develop an algorithm that's got machine learning in it and they test it. They, they, they say, listen, this was our combined opinion that we agree on on 300 cases. And then the algorithm performs almost perfectly, right? So now the algorithm is, is attaining the result that two or three employees working against each other used to obtain. And if they can trust the algorithm enough, um, maybe they can co-invest in it. And then there will still be staff administering this. There will still be jobs, but there might only be half as many and there won't be as much antagonism, right? Mm -hmm. That could play itself out. In, and, and that's sort of, you're seeing the beginnings of that kind of thing in a variety of areas with, with um, EHR integrated computerized decision support, um, which is now required for, um, for imaging for Medicare, but it's not AI yet, right? But eventually you could see that a common data infrastructure and a common set of tools, if we can get there um, around the medical necessity could, could have tremendous savings and also probably improve the quality of what's done, right? Uh, and so that thing played out on care management would look like well, we're all gonna, we're gonna sit down and agree within a given geography, what do your care managers do and what ours do? Maybe they all should be on your side, maybe it should all be on our side, but we should be paying the same people to do the same thing. So it's kind of a standards approach, right? And there aren't national standards. Um, the, the standards tend to be local. And if you can agree upon standards and tools to administrate them, then you will have effectively, in many instances, substituted uh, capital for labor, right? You've done a capital intensive process, you set up a, a, a product or, or, or a technology tool that is agreeable to both sides. And now it's doing something that might've taken a lot more people to do and taken a lot more time to do in the past. So through those types of projects, you could increase productivity and efficiency, decrease the administrative load of healthcare, right? Um, also imp probably improve the time to decisions, which will improve the access and the perception of the experience on the patient side. So these are just, some examples of how all this stuff kind of stuff works together. And I have, um, I do what I do right now because I've seen a lot of opportunities for growth within healthcare where the payer and the provider collaborate. They just seem a lot closer to reality than um, some of the similarly theorized things on the, on the life sciences side, right? So we could talk about that as well, but I think there's tremendous immediate, you know, fairly immediate possibility three to five years if payers and providers 
share standards, share data, make similar investments in innovative platforms. So this sounds like what you're working on with Care First. I mean, yeah, very philosophically. Much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Duran, this has been great. Um, I really in, enjoyed talking to you as I always do. Um, I hope one day I can have you back and ask the other long list of questions that I had, but I yeah. thought this is terrific. And I, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the direction that we took too. Cool, anytime. Yeah, I, I tend to give long answers. So, you know, uh, might take two interviews to get through all the questions, but I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun, John. Much appreciated. And please say hi to uh, Neil for me. I will, absolutely. From all of us at Darwin Research Group, thanks for listening. Healthcare Rounds is produced and engineered by me, Kim Ishudo. Theme music by John Marchica. Darwin Research Group provides advanced market intelligence and in-depth customer insights to healthcare executives. Our strategic focus is on healthcare delivery systems and the global shift toward value-based care. Find us at darwinresearch.com. See you next round.